Thanks Chris. I'm now going into more detail about our bare metal support package. I'll cover why customers are asking for it, what we deliver and how to use it. So, why bare metal support? More and more often, end customers are finding that they're reaching the performance limits of their current microcontroller families. They need more performance, but don't necessarily want to step into the world of embedded Linux. Or it could be that embedded Linux is just not suitable for their end application. Or perhaps they want to run a real-time operating system like Azure Autos. There is another reason why bare metal is useful. During the board bring up stages, quite often the person that performs the initial software bring up and testing of peripherals is the person that developed the hardware. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes that person is not familiar with embedded Linux. They may not have an embedded Linux desktop machine to work with, and they're not familiar with device tree and Linux um, board support packages. So bare metal is really useful to be able to write simple C test routines to exercise peripherals on the chip without having to step into the whole world of embedded Linux. So this is useful even if your end application is going to be Linux, but the initial board bring up is done just with bare metal routines because no Linux knowledge is required. So what do we deliver with our STM32 Cube MP13 bare metal package? So it's a set of um, Example these are examples and obviously all of the um, device drivers to run bare metal on the MPU. So in terms of uh, how peripheral examples, we have standalone Cube IDE example projects for all of our individual peripherals that exist on the microprocessor. These are standalone examples that you can import into Cube IDE and use as a basis for your own examples. We also have some template projects for you to start from scratch, essentially. We also support Azure Autos on the MPU. Azure Autos, by the way, is becoming Eclipse ThreadX now that Microsoft has passed over governance of that project to the Eclipse Foundation. So right now in our package, you'll see references to Azure Autos, but moving forwards, we'll obviously move towards Eclipse ThreadX. So in terms of Autos examples, we have examples using the kernel itself, ThreadX, we have examples using the file system, FileX, networking stack, which is NetX Duo, USB stack, which is USB-X. On top of the HAL peripheral examples and the Zoratos examples, we have a first stage bootloader that will allow you to load code into external DDRSD RAM memory. We also have some flash programming tools that currently allow you to program uh, an SD card or serial nor flash on the device so that um, you can program uh, your application into the uh, flash whilst it's on the board. Our development tools, Cube IDE and CubeMX, also now have new project wizard support so that we can create a bare metal project from scratch within Cube IDE, and we'll show you that during the demo stages. So where would I get um, this uh, STM32 Cube? STM32 Cube MP13 uh, HAL library. So, if you're familiar with our Cube tools, so Cube IDE or Cube MX, then you can um, download the packages you just would do any of our uh, normal MCU packages using the embedded software package uh, manager. Uh, and it will look like this here. You can also download the source code directly as a zip archive from sd.com. And this is a link if you click in the presentation when you download the presentation that will take you to uh, sd.com and where that uh, download is. Also, ST now support posting of our um, firmware packages on GitHub. So you can go and git, club, uh, git clone the sources directly from GitHub. So taking a little look at the overall architecture of the package, Obviously, at the bottom level of the software stack, we have the hardware itself, and um, we have some de development kits for the uh, MP1 processor. Uh, for the MP135, it's the MP135 discovery kit. And then in terms of software, on top of that, we have all of the, what we call the HAL, the hardware extraction layer. These are the device drivers for the individual peripherals uh, on the chip. And these are available either as um, fairly high-level extracted uh, libraries, which we call the HAL. But if you're sensitive about code space sizes, then we also have some lighter weight uh, device drivers called our low-layer uh, libraries. 
On top of that, we also have some um, support support um, packages for individual peripherals that are on some of our demo boards. So for example, support for Ethernet Phi, support for displays, etc., etc. So this is at the device driver level. And then on top of that, we have the RTOS and middleware um, uh, level. So in this particular case, we have Azure RTOS, um, the actual operating system itself, and all of the middleware that comes associated with that, as we discussed, it's uh, USB-X, NetX, Duo, etc. But we also include ST's own USB device library uh, for uh, device and for host. So if you don't want to use Azure Auto, for ex Azure Auto, for example, but you still need USB support, then we still supply the USB device and host stack libraries to run on the, on the MPU. And then at the top level, we have a set of examples and um, application level examples and applications are more fully featured examples. The package also contains some utilities for creating binaries with, a, 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 with the correct header format, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. So in terms of the uh, package directory structure, it will look very, very familiar to you if you've used any of our microcontroller family HAL libraries before. So for example, we have the device driver um, directory, and this includes all of the standard HAL peripheral device drivers, both uh, low level and uh, at the HAL level for the MPU. We have a middleware directory, and this contains all of the source code for uh, the Zura RTOS that includes the stack, the operating system itself, ThreadX, plus all of the middleware, plus our USB host and device libraries. And we also include a SimSys RTOS adaption layer as well for ThreadX. Then we have the projects directory, and in the projects directory, we have all of our application examples and templates. So there are two subdirectories. Um, one for the DK board, which is the publicly available MP135 development board. And then another one for custom board examples, because there are, although the DK board has um, a large number of peripherals on it, it doesn't include every single peripheral that we have on the MPU. So no S nor flash, for example. So we have some custom examples that allow you to see how you would use those peripherals, even though they're not supported on the DK board. And then finally, we have a utilities directory, and in there we've got uh, something called the image header utility. And this is used to generate wrapped binaries so that the ROM code will recognize your, uh, your, your, your own application and boot it at startup. So how do we use these examples? So, all of the HAL peripheral examples are small enough to run from the microprocessor's internal SRAM. There's one exception to this, which is the LCD controller example, but all of the rest are small enough to run from the internal SRAM. And the internal SRAM on this device is 128K bytes. Now, obviously for a real world application, you will probably still need to um, uh, load the example into external DDR SD RAM and uh, we have some utilities to help you do that. But um, when running the simple examples in SRAM, they're loaded into the SRAM of the device directly using the Cube IDE debugger. So within Cube IDE, we can connect to the target um, and download the, S uh, the code into SRAM. And to make that life easier, we, we put the MPU in what's called developer mode, and I'll explain what developer mode is on the next slide. So it's still possible to boot the application from external memory, like SD card, for example, without having to connect your debugging cable and, and your Cube IDE. But um, by default, the application will still run in internal SRAM. Also, for the ROM code to recognize your application, it needs to be wrapped with a special header so that the RAM code will recognize it. If you wish to run your application from external SD RAM memory, which most um, uh, uh, real world applications will need to do, then first of all, you need to initialize the SD RAM controller. 
And we have a couple of examples to do that as part of the package. The first one is uh, the DDR init application, and this basically just allows you to initialize the memory controller, and then you can use the DDR SD RAM um, at that point to run your own application from it. But we also have a, a first stage bootloader application, and we've got two versions of it uh, one for bootloading from uh, SD card, and there's another version for NOR Flash as well. And this application um, boots a simple bootloader from, in this case, the SD card and configures the SD RAM for you and then loads your main application into SD RAM. The Azure Artos examples are obviously more real world uh, size and therefore they're too big to run in internal SRAM. And so uh, they must be configured to run from the DDR SD RAM, which means that the SD RAM, first of all, needs to be configured first. And you can do that as we just discussed with the DDR init program or the first stage bootloader uh, programs. So the simple template, uh, simple um, peripheral examples, are, when we load them with Cube IDE, we put the device into what's called developer boot. And in some documentation, you may see it referred to as engineering boot. And this is just a special boot mode where we set the boot pins so that the, the Cortex-A7 device literally just sits in a in an infinite loop. It's toggling um, one of the port pins, PA13, and it sits in an infinite loop. This is useful because uh, as part of that, we re-enable the debug connection. So by default, when um, you load um, a program via the ROM code and it starts its bootloader, one of the very first things it does is disables the debug connection, which means it's a lot harder to actually connect a debug cable to the, de to the device. So to make life easier, we, um, we ask that you set the board or set the MPU to boot into uh, developer mode, developer boot, and then it just sits there waiting for you to connect a debugger cable. Now, just to make absolutely clear, when you secure this device so that it will only boot from an authenticated and secure boot flow, this developer boot mode is disabled in hardware. It's no longer accessible. It's just there for the development process of allowing you to easily connect a debugger. So I mentioned before that if you wish to use code in the SD RAM, then first of all, you must configure the DDR SD RAM controller. Okay, and we provide an example of how to do that. This is called the DDR init example and it's in the example subdirectory um, for the, uh, the, the example projects. And what it does is um, you load it into memory using Cube IDE. It will initialize the clock tree of the processor. It will initialize the power management IC if you're using one to make sure that all of the power levels are, uh, power uh, rails are correctly provided to the SD RAM. And then it will actually initialize the SD RAM controller in it itself so that now you can actually access external SD RAM memory. Now, at this point, it will, it will um, sit in a, a, a constant while loop, so we allow you to simply connect your debugger via, via hot plug. It's not a bootloader, okay, but it's, in allow, it's intended to allow users to um, configure and use SD RAM prior to running their own application, okay? If you want to uh, implement a, a bootloader, we have a separate example for that, which I'll talk about later. So the ROM boot process, um, it's important to understand this before we can, we can move on to understand how we boot things from external memory, like SD card, for example. So when the ROM code starts, it searches for the very first program or the first stage bootloader from the selected boot device. So it reads the boot pins, determines where to fetch the uh, first stage bootloader from, and then goes and looks for it. Now, it recognizes the binary to execute by looking for specific headers. So it looks for the, uh, in the storage location for your executable, and it looks first for a header with a magic number. This header also contains the entry point address for the specific ap application. So, the ROM code looks for the header file. It uh, loads the header into internal memory, into SRAM block three, which is a small block of, of memory. And then 
uh, it loads the remainder of the program into what's called SysRAM, which is a 128k block of internal um, SRAM memory. It checks the header file for the um, entry point address and then sets the processor executing at that entry point, which in most cases is the uh, first stage bootloader address. If you want to know more about the header file format, uh, this link here takes you to the MPU Wiki article about the, the header format. So, in our Linux flow, the header is automatically generated for the bootloader as part of the uh, TFA build process. But we're not using Linux here, we're just using um, a, a bare metal uh, development flow. And so we provide a utility to generate this header for you. So in the utilities directory as part of the package, you'll see the utilities directory and then within there we've got a, a subdirectory called image header. And in there, there's a script file that we use and it gets called to generate um, the correct header information for the binary that you've just produced. Now this um, script will call an executable and uh, we have a Windows executable that can be used for Windows hosts but we also have Python executables that will run on uh, in a Linux environment. And if you want to know more about how to use this then there's a readme.txt file that accompanies uh, this, this utility. So this, um, this image header um, utility is included as part of the build process. So when you um, build your application, the very last steps are to run this script, which will take your binary file and uh, add the relevant header information to it. And the way we do this is that we, we add a post build script. Uh, within the cube IDE tools. So we go into the tool, we configure in the project settings that we add a post build step and we refer to this script, which means the script gets called after each build. So once we've got our binary and it's been wrapped with the correct header, we then need to program it um, to our external memory. So in this case, we're talking about SD card and we need to understand a little bit about how the ROM code um, views the SD card in terms of a boot process. So when the ROM code is booting from the SD card, it, it will search for uh, the, the first stage bootloader or the first executable file, and it will look for, potentially look for two copies of this, because if, if the first copy is damaged, it will then load the second copy. But it finds this first stage bootloader in one of two ways. So initially, the ROM code will look for what's called a, uh, a globally unique ID partition table or a GPT partitioned table. Okay, this is a, simply a partitioning scheme used for, for modern, um, mo modern disks. And if the ROM code finds a GPT table, then it will simply locate the first stage bootloaders by looking for a partition entry beginning with the name FSBL. If no GPT uh, table exists, then the ROM code will fall back to using the LBA addressing mechanism and it'll look for the first stage bootloader at LBD, LBA address 128, which is hex offset uh, 10,000. If it can't find uh, a first stage bootloader there, then it will check address 640. And more detail of this boot scheme is, is uh, available in this link here. Okay, so we have included as part of the package a very simple first stage bootloader application. Um, we have two versions in fact. We have one that will load from SD card and one that will load from SNOR. And I'm talking about the SD card uh, example here. And it's an application, a simple application, that you load onto the SD card and the bootloader will, um, at boot, it will fetch this application from the SD card and start it executing. So the first stages are that the ROM code starts executing, it goes to the SD card and it fetches your first stage bootloader uh, SDMMC application and it loads it into system RAM, into SRAM. It executes this application and this application will then configure the clocks of the MPU, it configures the DDR controller 
and initializes the SD controller so that your bare metal application now can access the SD card. It will then copy um, all of the information. Well, first of all, it checks in the header file how long the binary is, and then it will copy the length of that binary into, S into your external SD code. Finally, once it's done that, it will jump to the um, execution uh, address specified in the header and it will start executing your code from, from DDR SD RAM. And the way it's organized in terms of the SD card layout is, as we said in the previous slides, the ROM code will look for the first stage bootloader at physical address one, uh, LBA128. Okay. Um, so this is where we load your FSBL SDMMC application and its header file. That is loaded into internal SRAM, it executes, it configures the DDR controller and then it goes to a specific address LBA640 and that address there is, is determined by the first stage bootloader application so you can actually move your own example up and down the memory region if you wished but that copies it into SDRAM and executes from SDRAM. So, we also have uh, some utilities for programming external flash. So, um, it's fairly easy to, to program an S, a micro SD card um, uh, in the Linux world with, with custom um, partition schemes but it's a lot more difficult when you're using um, Windows. So we have a, an executable, well, a binary application that will run on the MPU, and it works with Qt Programmer to allow you to program um, your SD card with your uh, relevant binaries. But we also have a version for SNOR Flash, so if you have SNOR Flash soldered to the board and that's your boot source, then um, you don't have to obviously program the chip before you solder it to the board. We have this utility, and the utility essentially is a, a binary that runs on the MPU, interfaces to Cube Programmer, and then allows you to uh, run this simple loader on the MPU to program your main application into the external flash. Okay, so both uh, tools will communicate with Cube Programmer either via the UART. Uh, and the SNOR programming utility also has a USB DF DFU uh, capability as well. This is currently not implemented for the SD card tool, but it's coming basically. And also, as it stands right now, this loader program is provided as, as a binary only. Now, um, source code is available on request, but we're also planning to release it um, uh, the source code as, a, as a, a later release to mass market. Okay, and that's in the in the planning. So finally, uh, we have uh, some useful links. I hope um, on many of them relate to our STMPU wiki, and these links um, talk about the actual MP13 bare metal package itself and has some tutorials about how to actually start running with it and to load external applications. So, that's it for the theory section. We'll now go to a short hands-on. So, uh, I hand back to Adela. Thank you very much.